Hey guys, are the billboard charts important anymore? There's not a right or wrong answer, but judging from tweets and articles and a whole lot of discourse, I'm going to assume that a lot of people would say no. And that's fine, but here's an even better question. Have the billboard charts ever been important? So lately there's been a lot of talk about how the billboard charts are manipulated and rigged, and how having a number one song doesn't mean anything anymore, and how streaming has ruined the billboard charts. And to be fair, I do understand why those people feel that way. But I'm here to tell you that those people are wrong, because the billboard charts are probably more accurate than they've ever been. Billboard magazine was launched by William H. Donaldson and James H. Hennigan. The first issue was released on November 1st, 1894. It was eight pages long and cost 10 cents. All right, let's see it. That'll be cool. This is just about printing and advertising. I don't think I need to say much about this era. I think we can just skip forward. Okay, over the next few decades, the magazine began to focus more and more on entertainment, starting with advertising events like fairs and traveling attractions. They also began to publish gossip about popular entertainers because entertainment news would prove far juicier than articles on poster paste recipes. Speak for yourself, but okay. Also, Billboard developed something they called the Letterbox, a mail forwarding service for traveling entertainers, which they now call a precursor of today's email, and claim created a link between Billboard and the creative community that remains unbroken. Although they had already began to cover music by advertising things like sheet music and the tonophone, they talked about it more and more thanks to advances in technology like the phonograph and the radio. I really like this quote where they say, Radio broadcasting, if properly directed by the publishers to the extent where the song in question is not killed by being radioed to death, may prove beneficial and a stimulant to sheet music and record sales. Because we really did go on to radio songs to death, didn't we? Jukeboxes were rising in popularity in the 30s due to the Great Depression and they were being advertised in Billboard magazine because people couldn't necessarily afford to buy records and many nightclubs could not afford to hire live bands. They had a bunch of different versions of charts before they got to the Hot 100 or the Billboard 200 that we know nowadays, and ultimately I don't think it's important to go over all bajillion of them, so I'll just mention the ones that I think are important because after all this is a brief history. On the 4th of January 1936, they introduced the 10 best records of the week, which included three separate top 10s from the three top record companies at the time. On July 27th, 1940, they introduced the best-selling retail records chart. The first number one was I'll Never Smile Again by Tommy Dorsey, which had vocals from Frank Sinatra. They also started publishing a record buying guide, which later became the most played in Jukebox's chart in January 1944. In 1945, they started the Honor Roll of Hits, which was based on record and sheet music sales, as well as disc jockey and jukebox performance. They also started publishing a chart that showed the songs receiving the most play on the radio, which they named Discs with the Most Radio Plugs. Catchy name. They later changed it to records most played on the air. It gets worse though, because for a while their country chart was called Country and Western Records Most Played by Folk Disc Jockeys, and their R&B chart was called Best Selling Retail Race Records, and wow, they really needed to hire people who were better at naming things. Obviously, around this time, the music business was evolving. Many record companies were founded, such as Atlantic, Imperial, Mercury, Chess, Savoy, Electra, Vanguard, Blue Note, and Prestige. RCA Victor came out with 45s, which were more affordable, sturdier, and easier to store than the 78s that were popular at the time, and brought in a bigger and younger crowd. They were, as Rolling Stone called them, the iTunes 99 cent download of their time. A new generation of recording artists had also come to prominence. A front page story in the September 29th, 1951 issue reported on a wave of signings of such new talents such as Tony Bennett, Rosemary Clooney, and Eddie Fisher. And then on November 12, 1955, they finally debuted their first Top 100 chart. It combined a single's retail sales, radio airplay, and jukebox plays into a more comprehensive list. And finally, in August 1958, Billboard published its first Hot 100. We did it. We got there. It combined sales and radio airplay. The first number one on the Hot 100 was Poor Little Fool by Ricky Nelson. Singles were still the primary way of selling music, but album sales were growing in the 60s. They had published short album charts before, but in 1961, they started publishing a 150-position chart for mono records and a 50-position chart for stereo records. In 1963, they combined both charts into one 150-position chart. In 1967, they increased it to a 175-position chart, and shortly after, finally expanded to 200 entries. 
Obviously, the music industry underwent several changes throughout the next couple of decades. The popularity of cassettes in the 70s and 80s, or the start of CDs in the 80s that caught on later in the decade. The charts themselves also underwent several changes throughout the years. For example, in the early days, they went back and forth on whether the A-side and B-side singles should have been listed together or separately. On the Best Sellers and Stores chart, they were listed together, and the more popular side was listed first, which meant that they could flip back and forth while they were still on the chart. On the other charts, the songs were just listed separately. And then as if something that should be so simple couldn't become any more complicated, they changed their minds and started to list them together again in 1969, but only if both sides were considered to get enough airplay. It became even more complicated when songs started to have more than one B-side. This was eventually fixed when the charts started allowing non-singles to chart as well, but we'll get into that later. EPs were included in the Hot 100 until the late 60s when they were moved to the albums chart. And something happened in 1988. It's a good thing though. They acquired Broadcast Data Systems, or BDS. BDS was able to track radio airtime, which meant that now Billboard had actual data to base their charts on. How great. And something even bigger happened in 1991. Billboard started using Nielsen SoundScan data, which collected data on music sold from the point of sale systems and stores, which meant that once again, Billboard had actual data to base their charts on. So you might be thinking, well, then how did they track this stuff before? I'm going to attempt to explain to you how they came up with their charts pre-SoundScan and pre-BDS. If it sounds like it doesn't make sense, it's because it doesn't. By the way, I'm getting what I'm about to say and all of the charts used from their How We Track the Hits magazine. Okay, as for airplay, they included 236 pop radio stations, or at least that was the number at the time this was published. They used every pop radio station with over 100,000 weekly listeners, and some with under 100,000 listeners, but none with under 40,000. These stations would receive a call every Tuesday and would have to tell someone working for Billboard their ranking of the most popular songs of the week. The positions of each song in the ranking would then be converted into points, with the most popular song obviously getting the most points. The points were assigned in inverse fashion as shown in their graphs, which means that yes, the number two song on their list only got one less point than the number one song no matter what the difference in popularity was. The points were then multiplied by a number determined by the size of the radio station's audience. So, for example, according to their chart, if one of the four radio stations with over a million weekly listeners played a song, the points would be multiplied by 2.5. If it had, say, 300,000 listeners, it would be multiplied by 1.5. Then the points get combined for all of their reporting radio stations. They used a similar way of calculating retail sales. For the songs chart, they had a retail panel that consisted of 200 dealers, aka music stores. 150 of those dealers were used every week and 50 of them were changed from week to week. The retail reporters are separated into six categories based on their number of overall sales, and their points are multiplied by a number determined by what category they are in. The stores on their retail panel would receive a call from a Billboard employee, and they would tell them their top 30 most popular songs of the week. They also used an inverse point system for their retail panel, so the number one song gets 30 points, the number two song gets 29 points, and so on. 90% of the retail reporters were called on Monday, but 10% were called on Friday, so their weekend sales weren't included for the week for some reason. I literally could not find an explanation for this. For the album's chart, it's nearly identical. They had a panel of over 220 dealers that were contacted, once again, either on Monday or Friday, and they would tell the Billboard employee their 50 most popular albums, which would then be assigned points in an inverse fashion, then that's multiplied by the number determined by their volume of sales. When Billboard started using broadcast data systems, radio stations started being monitored. It would identify the songs being played, and each song was multiplied by the number of people listening to that particular radio station using Arbitron's data, a company that collected information on the size of a radio station's audience. That way, they would figure out how many people were exposed to a particular song. SoundScan tracked data through a computer program and kept a tally of the exact number of copies of everything sold in music stores every week. They would pay retailers a small fee to collect their data and then send the information to Billboard. And sure, there are some pretty obvious flaws in the system they used before, but nobody was prepared for the massive changes that would take place once they started using actual data and didn't rely on the employees of radio stations and retailers they called to act in good faith. Oh, I have a friend here. You can't see him. There he is. He wants to help. Can you read this script for me? Basically, SoundScan completely shook up the music industry in just one week. 
If you compare the charts from the week before these changes came into effect to the charts from the week they did, things seem a little suspicious. And it only got worse whenever people started noticing the patterns that take place when the charts are more accurate, and that should have been taking place that were not. Let's start off with a pretty simple one. From 1958 to 1991, a song had never debuted at number one on the Hot 100. Since 1991, 61 songs have debuted at the top of the chart. For some reason, before the change, songs would always slowly crawl their way up to the top of the chart, because that's just what everyone assumed a song should do, I guess. And a similar thing happened with the albums chart as well, which we'll get into later. I like the way they put it in this article by The Ringer. Albums open like movies, so for anything with an established fan base, the first week is usually by far the biggest. And albums open big and fall off unless they're lucky enough to generate five singles. Another big change is that people listen to more than just traditional pop music, and the charts never reflected that before. Big shocker, rap, country, metal, and alternative music suddenly started charting way higher than before. For example, as far as country music on the charts the week the change came into effect, Hank Williams Jr. jumped 37 places compared to the week before, Dolly Parton jumped 29, Travis Tritt jumped 82, and Dwight Yoakam jumped 85. The first song to be number one on the chart the week the change came into effect was a rap song, Set Adrift on Memory Bliss by PM Don. And while it was number three on the charts the week before, and it doesn't seem like that big of a shift at first glance, you'll notice that Billboard also includes columns that show the placement of a song on the chart for the two weeks prior. They changed the numbers the week the change came into effect to reflect what the song's placements would have been if they had been using this system for the weeks prior, and Set Adrift on Memory Bliss should have been number one for two weeks prior. They also published some test charts starting on December 8th, 1990 to test BDS and SoundScan before they applied the data to their charts. According to that data, the song should have been number one for at least three weeks. There were so many shocking placements that occurred immediately after Billboard changed their calculation methods that it's hard to list them all, but here are some of the standouts that make you realize that Breaking news, trusting some random employee in a record store to tell you what the most popular album of the week is without any actual data to back it up is going to lead to some inaccuracies. Skid Row's Slave to the Grind became the seventh album ever to debut at number one on the album chart, just a few weeks after the change was made. I'm not trying to knock Skid Row or anything, but the only artists to do this before were Elton John, Stevie Wonder, Bruce Springsteen, Whitney Houston, and Michael Jackson. So it kind of just makes you think. Michael Jackson's Black or White rose from number 35 to number 3 that week. Artists like Paula Abdul, Michael Bolton, and Prince all got number ones that they, according to test data, would not have gotten if the new method was already being used. Many artists who would not necessarily have been considered mainstream, such as Nirvana, NWA, Garth Brooks, and Ice Cube were charting way higher than anyone expected. And what did that lead to? More success for those artists, because people who never paid attention to them before saw them charting high and wanted to know what the hype was about and gave them a chance that they might not have otherwise. Record labels were willing to invest more money into acts that they wouldn't have before. These artists got the resources to put on bigger and better live shows. Smaller record labels saw success like never before, and surprise surprise, major labels were not a big fan of these changes, but there was nothing that they could do about it. And uh, speaking of major record labels, I want to get into another major change that took place once BDS and SoundScan started being used. Record labels could no longer bribe people, or at least not in the way that they used to. Are you surprised that they were doing that? Because you shouldn't be. That's right, the music industry, known for being super fair and super wholesome, was not actually so fair and wholesome. Oh no, what a shocker, that's so disappointing. Record labels would bribe people to say that their music was selling better than it actually was, or that it was getting more airtime than it actually was. Tom Silverman, the chairman of indie label Tommy Boy, told the New York Times that in the past, the major labels gave away refrigerators and microwaves to retailers in exchange for store reports. And I don't blame the retail employees for taking them up on it. If I was working minimum wage and some guy offered me free concert tickets in exchange for lying about some sales numbers, I would absolutely do it. Honesty and integrity be damned. But with real numbers, record labels couldn't just bribe some employees with free microwaves or whatever anymore. You actually had to sell albums to chart. Go figure. Not only that, but the system also allowed for a lot of human error and, uh, intentional manipulation. Let's put it this way. Pretend you're a record store employee in 2020 and SoundScan was never invented. 
and people still sell physical singles for some reason, I don't know, just go along with it. You're a diehard Swifty and Taylor Swift just dropped Folklore along with Cardigan. You have a bunch of the 7 inch singles in stock and Billboard calls you and asks you what the most popular song of the week was. If you're a big fan, obviously you say that you sold more of Cardigan than its competition, especially because you know that there's no data that can prove that you're lying. If you're a massive Justin Bieber stan and he just released Yummy and you work at a radio station, obviously you're going to tell Billboard that it was the most popular song of the week because you know that he really, 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 really wants that number one. He really wants it, and you can help him. Also, if you're running a record store, you can choose to be strategic about it. If the actual most popular album is completely out of stock, but you have lots of copies of the second or third most popular album, you might just lie and tell Billboard that that album is actually the more popular one. Because maybe if it hits number one, people will be curious and they'll come in and they'll want to check it out, so they'll buy your copies instead of seeing that the actual number one is sold out and leaving without buying anything. Even if someone reporting the songs or albums was trying to do their job honestly, maybe they just didn't keep track properly, or maybe they had a bad memory and it led to some inaccuracies. Billboard relying on everyone involved to be honest and accurate just wasn't realistic, especially because a lot of people involved had hidden agendas. However, with all of that being said, I just want to make something clear. I'm not trying to look at the situation with my 2022 goggles on and laugh at the fact that they didn't use SoundScan back in 1958. That's not realistic, I know that. And obviously I'm not saying that Billboard did all of this intentionally. They did the best with what they had at the time. My point in talking about this is to show that chart manipulation and payola are not new things, and that people who say that they are, are wrong. The Billboard charts aren't suddenly inaccurate because some stands play a new song by their favorite artist on repeat while they sleep. They're inaccurate because they literally always have been, and they probably always will be, at least to some extent. And while that is the biggest change in the charts that I wanted to bring up, I will call out a few that have taken place since then. Before December 5th, 1998, songs could only chart on the Hot 100 if they were available to purchase as a single. Basically, even if a song had a ton of radio play, if it couldn't be purchased, it could not chart. On this day, album tracks became eligible to chart if they got airplay. In 2005, Billboard started counting digital downloads towards the Hot 100, which meant that songs no longer needed radio play to be able to chart. In 2012, Billboard started counting streaming towards the Hot 100. In 2013, YouTube video views started being accounted for in the Hot 100. And interestingly, Billboard decided in 2020 that merch or ticket bundles would no longer count towards the charts. Basically, a lot of artists would automatically include a song or album with the purchase of a piece of merchandise or with a concert ticket, and that would obviously bump up their sale numbers. According to the new rules, unless the music is purchased as an add-on at an additional cost, it will no longer count. Also, the pre-ordering of physical copies used to count towards the charts, but now those units are only counted on the week they're shipped. So no more selling last minute CD singles or 7-inch records just to get an extra little bump and then shipping them out half a year later. Obviously, I'm not trying to say that every song that hit number one before 1991 didn't deserve it. Of course, there's plenty of songs and albums that performed well on the charts that would have regardless of if SoundScan or BDS were being used. I'm also not trying to say that the methods used to calculate the Hot 100 nowadays are anywhere near perfect. There are lots of ways that artists and labels and stands do manipulate the charts, whether it be remix after remix, long albums with a ridiculous amount of charts, deluxe editions, mass buying, bundles up until very recently, and uh, autographed digital songs. I'm not even fully sure what that means. I'm also not really sure why radio play is still considered significant. It kind of just seems like an outdated way of judging a song's popularity. Once again, the point I'm trying to make is that acting as if the billboard charts being manipulated or slightly inaccurate is a new thing is just plain wrong. It should not be news to you that the music industry is unfair, and it always has been. It also just strikes me as a little odd whenever someone says something along the lines of the top hits of the 70s and 80s were so iconic, no one's gonna remember the number one hits of today in a few decades. Like, do you realize how easy the internet and streaming in general has made it for people to discover new music? Of course we're not all listening to the same thing anymore. If they had today's technology back then, people's tastes would have been more varied then too. 
Also, I feel like it's a good thing that it's easier than ever to develop your own unique taste and listen to whatever you feel like, but if that's the hill you want to die on, you do you, I guess. I'll be over here listening to the music that I actually want to listen to instead of having a radio station decide what I should like for me. I just don't think it's fair to compare two completely different eras as if there haven't been major changes over the years that make them basically incomparable. Like, is it really possible to compare Beyonce to Michael Jackson? Are we really going to act like the circumstances around Taylor Swift and the Beatles' careers are the exact same? Basically, to make a long story short, no, the Billboard charts aren't completely accurate, but they've also never been completely accurate. It's not a new thing just because a song or artist you don't like got a number one. I'm so sorry I have to be the one to break this to you. I don't know. I just feel like pointing fingers at certain people whenever pretty much every major artist is involved with a little chart manipulation is just a little silly. So now can we answer the question, are the Billboard charts important? Maybe. To some people. I think that along with what we talked about, I need to bring up a very obvious point. A song being popular does not mean it's good. But also, a song being popular does not mean that it's not good. So I don't think the charts can really speak to the quality of a song in any way. I guess all I can really say is that if you care about being up to date with pop culture, the Billboard charts are kind of important, although I think you need to pay attention to more than just the number one song, considering how many iconic songs never made it to number one. I would say that the charts are good for very casual music listeners who only care about hearing what's popular, but I feel like those people probably just listen to the Today's Top Hits playlist on Spotify. Not that that's any more accurate, maybe I should make a video on that next. But when you look at the charts from any point between their creation to right now, just know that they're somewhat manipulated, whether that be by fans, record labels, or the artists themselves, and I don't think that there's a way to fix it. Thank you so much for watching, have a great day.